Before we get to the interview, I'd like to tell you about a special offer to subscribe to the Business Observer, which covers essential business news in Florida every day online and every Friday with a print edition. Unlock every Business Observer article on our website and app for only $1 a week. Sign up today and stay up to date with all the business news you need to be better at business. Go to businessobserverfl.com slash subscribe. Hello and welcome to the Business Observer from the Corner Office podcast. I'm Mark Gordon, Managing Editor of the Business Observer. Today's guest is Mark Lauren, founder of Mark Lauren Designs in Fort Myers. Mark, the other Mark, thanks for joining us. Welcome. My pleasure. Good morning, Mark. So you've been doing this business a long time, I think since 1985, and, and you mentioned just as we started, feels like yesterday. Tell us about Mark Lauren Designs and, and what you guys are about. Well, we're uh, uh, thanks for the opportunity, too. I really appreciate it. What we're about and what we do every day is we design and create one-of-a-kind, unique pieces of jewelry for our clients, for different organizations, charitable organizations, things like that. And i uh, got this incredibly talented staff. I was trained. I was actually making jewelry in high school. And um, when I got out of high school, I went to a technical school for uh, jewelry design, diamond setting, watch making, things like that. And I got lucky enough to get a job when I got out of technical school with one of the top custom goldsmiths on the North Shore of Chicago. And his name was Frederick Preet. And he had pretty much the top clientele in the North Shore of Chicago, which is pretty wealthy. So I got to learn in an environment like that. And, and Fred was one of my early mentors and he gave all these young people a chance and he took a chance with me. And, and every day has felt sort of like art class in high school. It's been um, a lot of fun. There's challenges along the way we can talk about later. But the day to day, people think really what I do as a jeweler is I just push pretty polished pebbles that I'm a retailer. But yeah. I'm actually a, a working goldsmith, uh, master goldsmith, silversmith, platinum smith. And I'm at the bench working 60 to 80 percent of the day. The other 20 percent is kind of management and marketing stuff. Yeah. So, but you've you've also sustained it. You know, we're going on on 40 years here, yeah. which um, is an accomplishment years. for any company. Was there a a tipping point in the marketplace where you're like, okay, I I got something here. This is this business is is going to be my livelihood, and can maybe get some other employees and things like that. What what were some of those tipping points? Well, when I, um, I was working for a company, I moved down to Florida from Chicago. I was working for a great company in the Chicago area that had five different jewelry stores, was Edgar Faye Jewelers. And my employer, who owned the company, Sid Faye, was also a tremendous mentor for me and really relied on my particular skills. And I was pretty young. I was 21, 22 years old. And I had a, a pretty deep experience with jewelry. I had experience working with clients having conversation with clients about designing pieces for them over the counter. And that was pretty rare kind of for my age. And, but I really hated the Chicago weather. So when he gave me the opportunity to move to Florida, he was opening up a store down in Fort Myers, Florida. I stuck my hand up and I said, I, I'd like to go. I'll do that. I'll do that. Yeah, sure. I'll walk on the beach on Sanibel. Sure. Um, and when I got down here, I, I just was blown away how beautiful it was, how nice the people were. And, where we opened up the store really didn't get a great start. I think they over-marketed it. It was too shea for Fort Myers at that right. time. So our store, while it was a beautiful store and we had a great crew, it didn't do very well. So eventually Sid had to close the store, sell it, and then he wanted the whole crew to come back to Chicago. And I, I really wanted to stay because I'd met these really wonderful people. And some of the old pioneering families from Fort Myers kind of took me in and I was doing work for them. And I noticed that in this area, there was really nobody doing the quality and the kind of work that I did. And I figured, well, if I stuck around and didn't go back to Chicago, I could figure something out. I could find a way to start a business, make my way. And the fact that it was paradise didn't hurt. Yeah. Yeah. So you filled a need, um, filled that that niche. Uh, yeah. So o over these years, what, what are some of you mentioned, you know, a, portion, a majority of your time is spent designing and working. What, what are the, maybe it's part of that, but what are the best parts about being an entrepreneur? Well, the best, and I didn't answer part of your other question too, sir, Mark, about some of the challenges and things like that along the way, we would call them hiccups, but you know, there were a couple of economic downturns that I went through. And as, as a young entrepreneur, I relied on some mentors to kind of assist me 
with business decisions that I didn't have the experience to make to continue my business. And then coming along, starting my own business, um, gosh, the best things that, uh, uh, the, the best things are that people come to us, like the real, the real heart of what we do. I have a particular skill where I can set diamonds and I can design jewelry. Now we add technology into that with CAD and 3D scanning. But the best thing is people come to me to help them tell somebody else how much they love them. Hmm. So yeah. I'm sort of contracted in this really poignant way. Right. To assist people at keep moments in their lives where they want to tell somebody else significant they love them whether it's an engagement anniversary special birthday present a commemoration for an organization that's honoring somebody so i take my staff and i both they know when they come to work every day we're doing something incredibly honorable every day communicating love in our community from one person to another from one organization to somebody uh, and that's and when you take something on like that, the context of your day changes. Yeah, it's not it's not just about pushing pretty polished pebbles. It, it's about making a significant impact in somebody's life. For sure, it's uh, it's it's rewarding in, in that way. And Very. so, so take a step back. So you mentioned you know overcoming some challenges in, in the yeah. downturns, and yeah. you know so you started in '85. Obviously, in the '90s there were some. There was post 2011, and then of course the housing recession. 08, 09. Tell us how you got through some of those difficult times and what was that some of what was well, some I'll of that advice that, you received? I'll use 08, 09 is really the, the the benchmark because I hadn't faced one like that before. And I, I luckily had a client come in who had a uh, infrastructure construction business. And he warned me that something bad was coming down the pike. And this was about three, four months out. And he wasn't getting any of the loan approvals, the projects. He wasn't booking any projects. And he saw that the banks were starting to get very nervous about loaning money. So I had about a three, four month heads up that something was happening. And and that's then the banks in Iceland started to fold. And that was the, the domino effect that started to hit. And Southwest Florida was almost ground zero for a lot of that housing sure. issues and the mortgage crisis. And so we, we quickly um, uh, tightened up. We stopped all buying. Uh, we, we luckily we have a really strong service shop so we've got these talented goldsmiths so we started we saw people bringing in more gold to sell to generate cash right we were doing more service work for trade for gold rather than people opening up their wallets um we were doing a lot of repair and and that and, and the gold buying and the repair were probably the thing that helped save us financially on a, on a month-to-month -month basis and then my um, mentors were giving me some other advice about how to have conversations with my banking partners who have been really great. And one of the things I would emphasize is as a small business, I've been really fortunate to work with local, wonderful banks, strong relationships where they know my business, they know me, they know our position, our place in the local community. And when they could have easily pulled paper on a couple of notes, they didn't because they knew we could handle our debt service. Yeah. And they knew what our impact was in the community and they wanted to help support that. So it was a pretty uh, vibrant conversation back and forth during those times. I was very upfront with them with what was happening with our business, what our receivables were, what our payables were. They were really upfront about how they could help, how they could help stabilize us through those troublesome times. And I just bought a piece of property in a building six months before the market collapsed. So really? So you had that, that on your head as well. <laughs> that went on my head too. So we put all the renovation and all the other things that we were going to do. And luckily I didn't have any deposits and contracts signed. We could put that on hold and we still to this day haven't really done any of that major work. Yeah, I get it. Well, that's certainly good advice in terms of um, becoming friendly with your local banker. Yeah. And the other part of it is local, um, not yeah. national banks because a lot of my friends who had gone and changed their whole financing structure to go with national banks that were offering these incredible packages and repackaging their home mortgage and everything they were the first ones to pull paper and everybody because they panicked and they were told listen this is what you all have to go out and do and then the local banks having those personal relationships they made those decisions right here in our town and i think that made a huge difference yeah actually you know it's a good segue actually because you talk about local I wonder if that's one of the challenges you face, right? Because there's there's these national and probably global chains in your industry. We won't mention any of them um, that okay. have really that's big marketing okay. budgets. How do you do that's a good point. Yeah. As an entrepreneur, how do you sort of combat that or fight against some of these big chains with big pockets? 
Well, a lot of our marketing uh, um, is about local. Is you know we're a local jewelry designer. We're local, right in your community. The money that you spend with us stays here in this community. We do a lot of philanthropic stuff, like a lot, and that's really our major marketing partnership in the community. A lot of different charities. We're donating pieces of jewelry. We're donating experiences. We show up when we donate. We don't just give somebody something and say, okay, and show them the door. Sure, um, right. Myself or one of my staff show up, and we try to have FaceTime with uh, the folks involved with the organization. That makes a difference, and and we're known probably more so than other – my competitors in town really were friends, even though we're competitors. Uh, we kind of stay out of each other's lane when it comes to different marketing initiatives. They sure. know where I show up, and I know where they show up. And we support them. They support me. We sometimes send clients back and forth, depending what's going on. But it's much easier to be uh, complementary than strong competing with each other in an and adverse relationship. Yeah, I get it. Well, going back to leadership, Mark, what, what are some characteristics you look for in a good leader? You know, whether it's an employee that you're promoting or a store manager or just somebody in general in your business, what are some of those things that stand out to you in leadership? Uh, so people rise to the top, Mark, in a group. So there'll be like, I've got five goldsmiths that I work with and I, and there's one or two that tend to be more oriented for decision-making. They're the ones that'll stand up and say, I think we should do this. Or what do you think about this? And I'll refer to my daughter. My middle daughter was in the Navy and she wasn't really a, a, a strong leader, I would say, before she went in the Navy and she was a Navy corpsman. And the Navy really brought her leadership skills out such that when she retired out of the Navy, she was pretty unrecognizable. Uh, any organization really? wanted to get her because she, she knew how to make decisions. She knew how to be responsible for her decisions. She showed initiative when there was something going on rather than standing behind everybody waiting for someone else to make a, a move. And that's kind of what we look for. We look, people, look for people that uh, show up, that voice their opinion and I'll even ask, like, okay, who wants this job? And yeah. Why do you want this job? But, there, you know, there's zillions of leadership books out there about how you spot that. But I think they rise to the top. Yeah, the, the decision making. It's like we when we've hired reporters here at the Observer Media Group, I'll sometimes say, you want I want the writing skills and the reporting skills, obviously. Yeah. But I want problem solvers, right? And that could sure. be in any job. You want somebody who's able to just step up and say, yeah, I got this. I can do this. Yeah. Uh, what leadership and some people that aren't, aren't really people people. Yes. And, and we, we, we love them because there's something they're contributing to our team. Sure. But we also know don't put them in front of other people or yeah. don't let them work with clients because it could be dangerous. Well, so yeah, right people. Have to bring up later. Right people in the right seats on sure. the bus for sure. Sure. What's a piece of leadership advice maybe from one of your mentors you talked about before that stuck with you, a piece of advice that uh, you still resonates today? Uh, it would definitely be my my second employer, Sid Say, that I moved to Florida with. And Sid uh, exposed me to a lot of great stuff that was self-help, self-awareness work. And he knew if I was going to become a better person and I was going to be more self-aware, uh, I'd make a better employee. And it was all about listening. And, I, and to this day, I think that's one of the strongest pieces of advice. If I'm sitting with a client, if I'm sitting with one of my staff, if I'm in a board meeting with a group of volunteers and board members, most people have tr difficulty listening, like really listening and paying attention, like almost intimate attention to listening. Everybody wants to voice their opinion and be heard. And, but, um, you know, God gave us two ears and one mouth. Yeah. I have some staff members that are really expert at listening and they also seem to relate really well to clients because if I'm, as an artist, I'm, I'm trying to get my designs out into the community and I'm fortunate enough where I can do kind of what I want when I'm free to do that. But when a right. client's sitting in front of me and they're contracting me to do something, it's really important to listen. Yeah. It's a good point to how do you balance that line? Okay. So they're coming in and they're paying a significant amount of money for this yes. and they say they want X and you're the designer. You're like, well, that's not going to look good or that's going to be overshadowed by this. How do you handle that back and forth between a client? That Oh, it's a great uh, question, Mark. It, it, it is a balance. And again, it goes back to listening where I wait for an opportunity. It's, a lot of times the best ideas are coming from the client. They don't have yeah. the technical background that we do. 
So they're also hiring my expertise and my technical background to assist them with whatever idea. And, and many times they'll come in with no idea and we'll take a little bit of a journey together. I'll show them different things. Um, and I listen for their response as we go through that process. So we try to close the parameters down slowly towards a direction where we can proceed with doing sketches for them and bringing some images in for them to see. And with our CAD design programs, we now have the opportunity to create a piece of jewelry and show them a photograph first before we even create it so that there's no unmet expectations about what we're going to deliver when the day comes. And it's really rare that we miss. Yeah. In the old, in the old days, we miss quite often. And you had, to, you had to like suck it up and say, OK, well, let me redo it. Let's start over. Right. And, we're, and now we're at about 95, 96 percent success when we deliver a piece. That's awesome. I'm going to go on, on speaking of jewelry, this is kind of a deep industry dive here, but, yeah. but I was thinking about in, in the Sarasota area, uh, this is going back. I, I've been at the business observer for almost 20 years and about 18 years ago, there was a company that made lab grown diamonds in yeah, Sarasota. That was, Gem that was Gemesis. I've been up at their company. Gemesis. And, and Gemesis. they had all these machines and I loved it because the founder, his name was Steven Lux. I still remember that L U X. And I thought that was so great because it was luxury, but, and, and then as well. Yeah. Right. And they had all these machines right. and, and they were doing it and then they just kind of went out. And now I've been seeing that this is coming back, right? The, Lab grown. Yes. So where's the industry right now in, in terms of lab grown diamonds? Well, we could have a whole separate podcast on that, Mark, because it's a tidal wave. It's a tsunami coming. Yeah. And I just did a, a bit with Fox News, one of my friends who's a uh, an anchor on Fox News. And we did a, a great oh, half hour conversation with our cameraman about lab diamonds. And, and it wound up going national because I think the information that we presented resonated with people who didn't know what was going on. Yeah. And we've been watching that technology, like you said, for 20 years when I went up to Genesis to see what they were doing and what's this product. And and where we come from is is whatever our clients are asking for or want, we're going to try to provide that. Sure. So I'm not, I didn't take a stance like a lot of my jewelry friends that say, oh, I'm not handling lab ground diamonds. That's not real stuff. I'm not having that in my store. And I'm like, well, that's great. We were seeing people coming and asking for it. So great. That's more business for us. And we've established over a number of years, wonderful relationships with some of the biggest lab grown diamond firms. Most of them are, are coming out of India. We thought China and Russia was going to dominate that industry, but really it's India. And they're growing them. They're doing their own cutting. We actually have two of our own uh, trademark diamond cuts that we're doing now with lab grown because it was too costly to do that before with naturally mined diamonds. And we're at about 68% now lab grown when people come in and we're selling engagement rings really? and items of jewelry. Yes, it's it's significant. And the other part about that is, so if I'm, if I'm buying 68% of my lab grown diamonds, I'm not buying 68% of naturally mined diamonds from my former diamond dealers. Yeah. That means they're sitting on 68% of those goods. What are they going to do with them? So you, now you have inventory that has to be moved to generate income for operations. So yeah. they either have to barter and trade with it or discount it to move it. So we're expecting to see pot diamond prices come down a little bit. Um, lab grown diamonds have been slowly decreasing as more and more growers have been getting into the uh, industry. And I had somebody ask me yesterday, well, if they can make them, where's the value? If they can make as many as they want, where's the rarity and the value? And then I go back to De Beers for generations controlled right. the supply. So while De Beers created scarcity, they had all their vaults full of diamond crystals that they sure. didn't release so that they could create this aura of scarcity and luxury. And now even De Beers is growing land grown diamonds. Yeah, it's certainly it's sort of a economics class in uh, supply and demand. And when it is <laughs> one goes up and the other goes goes down. I can tell you though, our, our industry will not be the same. It's it's changed yeah. permanently, I think, for the good. Because the, about two weeks ago, we had this wonderful young couple come in who I, they were looking for a, a diamond engagement ring. And she had kind of decided she wanted natural, which was fine. She was a little bit aware of labs. And he said, well, tell me more about these lab grown diamonds. So we're, right. I showed them both. And I said, the only comment I'll make, because you should have whatever you want, is that with the lab grown diamond, it's larger and more beautiful than this one. And the money that you'll save, you can pay for your entire honeymoon. And they're both looking at each other and they're going, we need to talk. You know, this, this is a different. And they were like back the next day looking at lab grows. 
Uh, wow. Well, well, it's not look, for everybody. It's not for everybody. It, a quick story reminds me of this is uh, more than 20 years ago. Uh, and if my room, my old roommate from Jacksonville, Florida, Dan Canberra is listening, he would remember he's a, uh, a rock engineer. He worked for a mining company. And wow. when I was getting engaged, he told me I was in Philadelphia at the time and he told me to buy cubic zirconium and she'll never know the difference. And I did not take his advice. I went. I went to uh, Steven Starr in Philadelphia, the famed jeweler there. and Yeah, Steven uh, Starr. I, I used to work in Philly, and Steven Starr was in my aerobics class I taught. Really? He's yeah. a very charismatic individual. Oh, at he least. was. He was. <laughs> so, yeah, so I, I uh, in case my wife is listening, that was a Steven Starr engagement ring. So, uh, but it does change, you said it changes the dynamics of uh, people's buying perceptions and what they're getting. It's a huge generational change. Yeah. So we've got younger folks coming in who are very well educated about this opportunity and they're saving a tremendous amount of money. But the other part about lamp growing diamonds is people think, oh, well, where's the investment? And for years, diamonds were – and mostly diamonds have never been bought as an investment. Investment is when you buy low and you sell high. Sure. Diamonds have mostly been bought for commemorating an occasion with no plan to resell them. Uh, maybe pass them on to different family members, but not right. to sell them. Not so for when you've got a lab-grown diamond on your hand that's twice the size of what you thought you could buy, and to everybody, it, it's like, oh, what a beautiful diamond, and they don't know. We, under a 10-power microscope, we can't tell it's a lab-grown yeah. diamond wow. because it's a real diamond. Very telling. It, it's it's a crazy time in our industry. For sure. One last question about your business and, and yeah. sort of your career what advice would you give to somebody, either maybe in jewelry, but anything retail related, because obviously you got the retail side. What advice yeah. would you give to young entrepreneurs? I, I just answered this at a, at a jewelry convention a couple of weeks ago. Start. Just start. Just do it. I have this conversation with my youngest daughter who's in London getting her master's in entrepreneurial science. And I said, you know, it's great that you're getting this information, Hayes. Her name is Hayes. I said, but... It, it, you cannot gather enough information to make yourself feel comfortable to start. Yeah. It's first, and even Sly Stallone will tell you, just start. Just begin. And I think Tom Cruise just said it on a podcast to somebody what, in, getting involved in the film business. Just begin somewhere and you to will learn it. as you go. Great advice. Excellent. What's on the horizon for Mark Lauren Designs? Any Anything, projects you're working on, anything you can tell us about coming up? Uh, we're thinking about putting up a, a new building next door on the lot that I own. We were kind of like in a junky 1950s duplex that we bought in 08 before the crash. Right. We've been keeping this band-aided together, but we're looking at the opportunity of being able to uh, raise a building that will have all the pertinent technology and security from the get-go rather than having to do it layer after layer after layer. Uh, and also redesigning the building so that our goldsmithing studio is like right in the center. And full floor to ceiling glass walls all the way around. So it'll really be jewelry as theater where people will walk in and they'll see our talented goldsmiths working away on things. Yeah. And the showcases will then sort of be around that um, enclosed shop. Awesome. That's kind of what we what we're working on right now. We're taking the very slow path set. Uh, we're still really busy, so um, that kind of fits in when we have time. Excellent. Well, before we let you go, Mark, I got three rapid fire questions go ahead all right what is the most used app on your phone most used app on my phone uh pinterest pinterest oh cool that makes sense you're looking at cool stuff i'm a very digital guy yeah yes do you have a go-to song that you sing in the shower and what is it it's Beatles song eight days a week love it energy I sang it to all my daughters when they were little oh that's amazing that's I can't say. You should know that people pay me cash money to not sing. Not sing. Well, that's why it's good to do in the shower. Same. Yeah, Same when they're here. down, then they don't know any different. Exactly. Yep. Would you rather sail around the world or drive around North America in a van? Sail around the world. I thought you were going to be sail. It's more beautiful. Well, you can, you can get a lot of beauty in a van too, but I thought you'd be a sailing guy. Excellent. Mark Loren of Mark Loren Designs in Fort Myers. Thank you so much for joining us on the From the Corner Office podcast. My great pleasure, Mark. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you for listening to the Business Observer From the Corner Office podcast. I'm your host, Mark Gordy. This podcast was produced by Reed Corley of the Corley Company in Sarasota. To hear more episodes of From the Corner Office podcast, 
go to businessobserverfl.com.